have our PA back up the way it should be. If you have your Bible this morning, I'd like to invite you to open them to the book of Genesis chapter 38. We go line by line, precept upon precept, just the way the Bible says we're to study God's word when we come together. And that way you don't just get my favorite sermon topics or uh, something else that won't really benefit you in the days to come. But Jesus said we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, and that means all of God's word. And so we have to be very mindful to assimilate everything. And again, sometimes um, when Jesus said that, he said that we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He was speaking about the Old Testament. Now, of course, the New Testament is really important for all of us today, but uh, understanding the foundational principles of God's Word is so important in the days that we live in. Because a lot of things are being passed off as godliness or Christianity that have nothing to do with God. And a lot of the things that are said to be God have nothing to do with the Bible. So that's why when we know the Bible, it's going to protect your heart in the days to come. And the best way to do that is line upon line, as the book of Isaiah says, precept upon precept. And so we're in chapter 38 today. This is one of these weird chapters in the Bible that uh, for, uh, well, I see most of the kids are out of here good because this is one of those XR rated chapters in the Bible. Oh, did I say that? Yes, I did. And as we read this here, you're going to see that it's very unusual. But but why, I think a lot of times, why did God have this put in the Bible? Well, he had it put in the Bible because, first of all, there is nobody that can say, well, hey, I'd go to church, but if I walk through the doors, the walls would cave in. No, because when we really read the Bible, you realize that the lineage of Christ was made up of not perfect people, but people just like us. And I think that's really important because a lot of times we have a misconception of people that God will use. And I believe this is why it's important to know God's word, that there's an old saying, Jesus loves me just as I am, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. I believe in God's restorative work in our life. I remember I went to a car show years ago, and there's this beautiful car sitting there. And I remember, and I walked up to the guy, and I said to him, I said, how much is that worth? And he says, he said, well, on the restoration of any car, it depends on who restored it. Some cars are worth less when they're restored than they were in their natural shape. And I said, well, why is that? And he says, because the person that was restoring it didn't know what they were doing. Well, it's the same way it is for you and me. Every one of us need to be restored. We all are walking wounded. We all have holes blown in us by the things of this world, by the experiences that we've had in life. And so God in his love, what he does is when we give our life to him, we become his property. And because I now belong to God, God begins his restorative work in my life. Unlike the world that claims they're going to rebuild you with washing your teeth with shiny bride or some other thing out there that's going to make your life better, it really doesn't. Only God really knows how to restore you, to keep you, and to cause you to be most useful for his kingdom. And by the way, friends, that's why we're saved and we're still here. It'd be great again that we'd just get saved and we'd be instantly transported to heaven. But he has left us here to be in service to him. It is by man, man fell. It is by man, the man Jesus Christ, also God, but the man Jesus Christ that redeemed us. But it's by man that the gospel is preached to the whole world. That's where you and me come in. So we want to be of the most service to our King while we're here. Let's pray. Father, as we go to your word today, we ask you now that your Holy Spirit would come in a special way and cause this ink on paper to become live words that go into our heart that change the way we think about life, that change the way we think about ministry, that change the way we think about ourselves. And so as we read these words now, may your Holy Spirit come now in a special way and bless each one of us, each one listening around the world by radio and internet. May you bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 38, we're looking at the lineage of Jacob, and we find one of the sons of his called Judah. 
Judah, as we all know, that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, a couple questions would be, well, why wasn't the first son, Reuben, or maybe the following two sons, Simeon and Levi, chosen instead? Why Judah, the fourth son of Jacob? Well, the first two we find had a, plotted a scheme to kill a whole town. And I believe they disqualified themselves in this. Then we find, the, in the, uh, the Bible tells us earlier that Reuben, the firstborn son, disqualified himself by messing around with his father's concubine. So now it comes to Judah. And Judah, again, is not one of the people, again, in fact, if you're trying to make a story about how wonderful you are, the chosen race of God, these are the kind of chapters, friends, you want to leave out of the Bible, not put in. But that tells me a lot about God. It tells me that God takes sometimes the messiest, the most hurtful, the most things we don't understand, and somehow God in his greatness, who's greater than the things that we've done wrong or people have done wrong to us, correct those things and make something wonderful. That's why I can truly tell you, accepting Christ as your Savior, he will fix the things in your life. He just does. And you say, well, how's he going to do that? I don't know. Because every one of us are individual, we all look different, we all act different, and God has a different plan for every one of us. Yes, a plan just for you. Doesn't that make you feel good when you, you get a little card, or you get a present just for you? And you open it up and it's what everybody else got. That doesn't make me feel good. But when I get something that really is what you need, something that was well thought of when somebody went and picked out that present, that means a lot because you go, wow, they had to really kind of know who I am to know what I needed. God knows what you need and why you need it. This chapter, I believe, is in the Bible to remind every one of us that no matter how much you fail, no matter how much you've done wrong, God is bigger than those things, and God will have his plan in your life. And so it starts off, it came to pass, chapter 38, verse 1. Came to pass at that time, Judah departed from his brothers. Now again, Judah, the fourth son of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Thus we get the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? So we understand that. It says they had, uh, he departed from his brothers, and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of the certain Canaanite who came, and her name was Susha, and he married her and went into her. Now, real quickly here, it was very clear that they were to marry within their own race, and we find Judah marrying a Canaanite woman. Now, the Canaanites, as the children of Israel came into the promised land, down the road here, another couple of, uh, hundred, uh, well, more than that, but a couple, <laughs> 600 years later, uh, they were to rout the Canaanites. Why? They were involved in idolatry. They were involved in a value system that is very foreign to the things that God loves. Now, some people say, well, what does God love? I think that's a good, fair question. If you don't know, read Romans chapter 1 in the New Testament. Romans 1 in the New Testament will, in a kind of a nutshell, give you what blesses God and what God doesn't like. Well, the Canaanite women, Canaanite race, they had a completely different value system, completely different set of gods. They were pantheists. They worshiped all kinds of things. Where God, when he separated Abraham out, said of you, I'm going to make a great nation. And so you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Now we're dealing with his son, Judah. And Judah, rather than marrying somebody from the Jewish faith, goes and marries a Canaanite woman. Now, again, here's why the Bible tells us all, so we all are aware of it. You intermarry with people of the world. You get in business contracts. If you're a, a person and, and you're, you're forming a company, don't get involved with people that are non-believers. Why? They have a different value system than you do. The Bible says, can two walk together unless they're in agreement? 
Well, if one person is serving the almighty dollar, the other person is serving God, you're going to have conflict down the road. That's why the Bible tells us never to get involved with non-believers, whether in marriage, whether in business, and really honestly when it comes down to your bosom buddies. Solomon says the good doesn't rub off on the bad, the bad rubs off on the good. Now why is that? Well, we all have an old sin nature that wants to rebel against God. Even being born again, I know this comes as a surprise to some of you, but even being born again, you can find yourself as a Christian doing very unchristian things. Why is that? Because we have a bend towards sin. Our old body, this thing here, likes to sin. Now the good news is we're going to get a new body one day, the Bible says, is not under the curse that happened to Adam and Eve. You're going to get a brand new body that doesn't have a propensity to sin. That's good news where the spirit completely reigns over the body. That's what we want now. That's why we gather together on Sunday morning and we worship God together. We do all these things because we want to build the spirit so that the flesh doesn't win. The flesh doesn't know what it wants. As much as we think it does, it doesn't. And the world plays upon that. The world plays upon you not knowing what you want. So it's, and I always use this illustration because it's one of the best ones I can think of. The Honda 50. You meet the nicest people on a Honda. I remember the ad. And I mean, it would do like blazing 45 miles an hour. It was incredible. And it was great until the Honda 100 came out. Then I didn't like the Honda 50 anymore. I wanted something bigger. And then the Honda 250 came out. And then the Honda 500. And then there was the Honda 1000. And then, and then the golden or of all the Harley. Okay, you, this is how it works. Now again, Harley Davidson was going to get into building computers. They couldn't know how to figure out how to make them leak oil. So they stopped. They just stayed making motorcycles. But the point is, is this. There was always a bigger thrill because our flesh doesn't know what it wants. The devil knows that. And so he knows how to hook you to get you. That's why they say, well, marijuana is a gateway drug. Well, you know, the buzz was pretty good. My head was spinning around. And then, oh, wow, let's get into acid, man, and watch the walls melt into the floor. See, it was, it's always something else. It's because our hearts are empty because we don't get our identity from God. We get it from the world. If you then marry somebody in the world as a Christian, you're going to find your value system being compromised. It's just the way it is. Now we don't, well, you know what? I'll date them and I'll get them saved. Date them, dunk them, and drop them. That's what I'm going to do. Well, that didn't work. Why is that? Because you get your heart tangled up with people. And you find yourself making, making covenants and marriages and, and business contracts with people that are different. This is what Judah did by marrying a Canaanite woman. Now maybe he thought he could change her. Because what's really amazing here is we look at this, the first name is actually a Hebrew name of his children. But the last two names of his children, born to Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, okay? The last two sons born to, born to him had Canaanite names. Now, I don't know what that was about. I don't know, maybe they converted, but I got to say that if you're carrying an, the name of the world, you're probably not where God wants you to be. Let's look at this. And Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went under her. And she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. <laughs> I don't know. The, the names in the Bible of kids sometimes really amazes me. What are we going to call him? Ur. Good name. She conceived again and bore a son, called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son, called his name Shelah. And he was at Chehebs when she bore him. And Judah took 
a wife for Ur, his firstborn son, and her name was Tamar. Now, Tamar is going to be a, a key player in this chapter. A lot of these names kind of get in the blur. But Tamar is important, as we'll read. Now, very quickly, to understand this, in the book of Matthew, when we look at the lineage of Jesus, there are four women who are mentioned, which is very unusual because generally speaking, in the Bible, you don't find women mentioned, daughters born unto them. It lists the men, but it doesn't usually list the women. But yet, Matthew thought it was extremely significant to mention at least four women in the lineage of Christ. And Tamar was one of them. So being we find Tamar making an appearance in the New Testament, I think is extremely important, and we'll see why. So it says, And Judah took a wife for Ur, name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn son, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Wow. Do you believe that actually people can be so wicked that God kills them? I, I believe that. I, I, I've seen that, I believe, in my own life. I've seen people that are just deliberately rebellious to God, and God says, you know, before you destroy, hurt, uh, uh, taint anybody else, trizzle, trazzle, trazzle, throne, time for this one to go home. Gone. It doesn't say what he did that was so wicked, but whatever it was, and being he had a Canaanite mother and really a pretty backslidden father, Judah, the hop to wickedness is pretty easy. Mom, dad, remember this. Your children learn their behavior from you. And again, dads, as much as you can be a dad that uh, reflects your father in heaven, you want to be that way. Because children view, when they say, dear, dear father, uh, they're, they're picturing you as they pray to God because they're relating to their father in heaven from what they see the attributes in your life. So that's, that's important. Because in other words, if they see you cussing and swearing and going nuts over things, well, they're, they're going to say, gee, is this the way God is? No. And by the way, I've shared this many, many times, I believe that's why the devil and Hollywood attacks the fathers so bad. That's why whenever you see a sitcom, whenever you see a movie, the dad is the stupidest person in the room. The 13-year-old kid knows way more than the dad knows. And it's repeated over and over again. Now you go back to the early 60s, Father Knows Best, My Three Sons, Andy Griffith Show. Dad always had the right answer. Not anymore, friends. That's gone. I believe the devil deliberately tries to downplay the role of the Father so that we will have more trouble relating to our Father, which is in heaven. And I believe if you watch, next time you watch a TV show, you know, it's kind of fun sometimes when you see television to analyze the mentality behind the story that they're portraying. Usually it's to bring you down the wrong bunny trail. But what's really weird is when you look at this, why are they putting fathers down so bad? I believe it's this reason. So when we look at this, you see God smote him because he was wicked. And Judah said to Onan, his brother, Go into your brother's wife, marry her, and raise up heir to your brother. This was customary in those days, so the lineage of the son would not die. And so the, the unmarried uh, uh, woman would then marry somebody else. In fact, they actually came to Jesus. And they said, Jesus, there was a woman, and, and, and she married a guy. And, 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 and he died, and then his brother married her. Most of you remember the story if you study your Bible. And, and he died, and then the same woman married the third son, and he died. I, this girl must have been a really bad cook. I don't know what the problem was here. But she wiped them all out. And so it was, they say, on to the seventh. Now, it was the Sadducees who didn't believe in life after death that posed this question to Jesus. And so they asked the question then, in heaven, whose wife will she be? 
Jesus responded and he said, you err not knowing the scriptures. For in heaven there's neither angel, no, there's neither marriage nor given in marriage, but as the angels are. Now, I think it's very important. He said, you err not knowing the scriptures. Oh, I, I, there's so many religions out there that believe you're sealed for time and eternity and you're going to propagate your own planet. And you're, no, no, no. Jesus said, you err not knowing the scripture. There is no marriage in heaven. I've shared this story before. I'll share it again for, the, uh, for some of you that weren't here. I remember one of the ladies in our church came up to me. She says, there was a group of guys, came to my, a couple of guys came to my door. They were very well dressed. They began to tell me that only in their church, if they got sealed in the temple, would they be sealed for time and eternity and you can have your, your spouse forever. She said, I ordered him out of my house. And I said, why? And she said, I spent 20 years with this clown. I'm not spending eternity with him. True story. The point is, there is no marriage in heaven. Now, is there marriage in heaven? Well, in a way, yes. Because the Bible says we are Jesus' bride. That's who we are. So we will be married in heaven to God forever, which is absolutely wonderful. Imagine that honeymoon. But as far as marrying another human being, now the Bible says we'll be known as we're known. So you're going to know each other. You're gonna, I believe you're going to know you're married, all these kinds of things. But as far as being married and that completeness that we're all looking for, that's found only in God, that will have forever with him in heaven. So that's good news. That's, that's the good news. But when we allow ourselves to become married to things in this world, people in this world that are not of God, that's going to open the door for problems. And so it was customary, and Jesus said, you err not knowing the scripture, you're as the angels are. Again, I think that's very important because actually we find that reflected back here where Onan now, the second brother, is to marry uh, Tamar, and have kids. So this is where the story comes in. And so Judah said to Onan, brother number two, go into your brother's wife, marry her, raise up heir to your brother. But Onan knew that his brother, that Onan knew that his heir would not be his. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife, that he admitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. I hope I don't have to explain this. <laughs> like I say, <laughs> see, this is the thing. When you go line by line, precept upon precept of the Bible, you just don't get my, my favorite topics like this, this love, and marriage. <laughs> Never mind. But you don't get my favorite topics. You got to have all of it. But this is what causes us as Christians to be balanced. Now, there are some that say, well, he admitted on the ground and God hates masturbation and therefore God will kill you if you do this. And the Bible doesn't say that. This wasn't that. He actually went into her. So if it was the other, he wouldn't have been messing around with her at all. But it says that he did not want to give his brother an heir. Now I think it's really important when we look at this because God was doing something in the supernatural. And by the way, friends, God is the always doing something supernatural, especially if you're a Christian. That, that's what I've always told people. And again, when you see abnormalities, look for God because that's where God usually is. Burning bushes that don't burn all the way up. Moses goes, wow, that's something you don't see every day. Cruises over there. God speaks out of the bush. Take off your shoes where you're standing is holy ground. And Moses meets God face to face in the burning bush. All the way through the Bible, you'll see abnormalities, but that's where God is. And so if you got an abnormality right now in your life and you're going, I don't understand why this is going on, look for God, because that's the way God works. Anybody can do things when everything is right. It's God that does wonderful things when everything is weird, okay? And that's why I, I, I believe, again, God is the same miracle working God that he was in the Old Testament, New Testament, and today. Oftentimes we haven't trained our eye to know what to look for. So he knew that it would not be his. So he, he wasn't, uh, he actually went into her. He, he was playing, he was messing around. You know, like, and he did this. Well, notice what it says. Verse 10. And the thing that he did displeased the Lord. Therefore the Lord, uh, the, God killed him as well. Wow. 
He was doing it out of rebellion to God, and God did not take that lightly, and so now he dies. Now, at this point, Judah probably, the father of these, my three sons, and two of them are now dead because of Tamar, probably is going, we want to keep everybody away. This girl's got the hand of death in her life, you know. I got one son left, and I don't think, you know, so anyway, we'll read here. And Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till my third son, Shelah, is grown. For he said, lest he also die as his brothers did, and Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now notice, he said, lest he also die like his brothers did. He didn't want to give his last son to this woman because this woman evidently had the kiss of death. So, I, you know, so yeah, you just stay in there. He was shucking and jiving her, okay? You come live in my house, wait till he gets a little bit older, and then I'll give you her. But he had no intention on doing that. You know, God sees it all, friends. And that's one of the things that, you know, whether you're at work and you're the one that's being picked on by everybody because you don't go along with the boys or the girls. God sees it all. And that to me is a great consolation for us as believers in him that God makes up the difference. Now notice what happens. Now in the process of time, Judah's wife died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shears at Timnah. And his friend Hira, the Adulamite, now that was his father-in-law, if you remember. And it was told Tamar, saying, look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear sheep. So she took off her widow's garment, covered herself with a veil, wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah, for she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given to him, to her as, a, as, as, as wife. So she recognized that she was lied to at this point. So she takes off her widow's clothes and she puts on the clothes of a harlot. Now, in the Canaanite belief system, they had what was called temple prostitutes. And this is one of the ways that their temples got their money was through prostitution. And it was actually required, some historians say, that if you were part of those temple worships, it was part of a young woman's duty to give maybe a year or two to this behavior to raise money for the temple. And so she, she puts on this, she knows which way he's going, and she just sits there and waits for him to come along. And so when she saw that she knew that the third son wasn't going to be hers, she comes up with this plan. Now verse 15 says, And when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she covered her face. Now that, uh, this is the first evidence we have of COVID in the Bible right here. Covered her face. Just kidding. Maybe that was what was wrong with our PA today. It had COVID on then he turned to her, by the way, and said, please, <laughs> these are, do not use these as pickup lines. And then he turned to her in the way and says, please let me come into you. <laughs> For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. By the way, this is weird. Even if you put on different clothes, you would think you would recognize your daughter-in-law. So this tells me the relationship between Judah and, and Tamar was really strained and he probably didn't have much to do with her or much to ever see of her. Otherwise, he, I mean, even if you put on a gunny sack over your head, you're, you're going to recognize their voice. You're going to uh, recognize the way they walk, their mannerisms, things like that. So it tells me that Judah was really extremely uh, detached from Tamar and probably because he, in his mind, viewed her as killing two of his sons. 
So she's veiled. He doesn't know who she is. And he propositions her and said, so she said, well, what will you give me that you may come into me? This is the art of the deal, I guess, here. And he said, I will send you a young goat from, from the flock. And she said, well, what will you give me as a pledge till you send it? I, I, she goes, you're putting this on your visa bill? I want to know when I'm going to get paid. You know, you, you, you want to do this. What will I get? Then he said, what pledge shall I give you? So she said, give me your signet and the cord. And the signet, by the way, identified you who you were. It was kind of like a credit card, if you will. Some people believe it was a signet ring. Some people believe it was actually a necklace that went around you with this emblem on it that identified you who you were. In fact, some people actually say that in certain times of Israel's history, all the males had a signet of some type, and it was so pronounced that you could actually buy things on credit by pressing your signet into soft clay, removing it, the clay would then harden, and they would know what you took because that identifier was yours. What will you give me? She said, give me your signet ring and your staff that is in your hand. And he gave them to her, went into her, and she conceived by him. Verse 19. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judas sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot who was openly by the roadside here? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. In other words, most people believe this isn't the place where they hang out. There, there was usually places where they would go, the red light district. And, and, and so he said, this, 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 no, there's not been anybody around here. <clears throat> and he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also, the men of the place said, there is no harlot in this place. Then Judah said, let her her take them for herself, lest we be shamed, for I sent this young goat and you and have not found her. And it came to pass about three months after that, Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, bring her out her and let her be burned. Wow. Pretty, uh, Pretty amazing, isn't it? I isn't that the way it is, though? Isn't the sins that we might be guilty of look so much worse on somebody else? If you remember, you go back to the story of Nathan, the prophet, and King David, about how he gave David this story. He said there was a man who had everything. He was wealthy. He had everything. And there was a, a, a poor man. That all he had was a, was a little ewe lamb. And this little ewe lamb was a pet to his family and to his kids. And they would even sleep with the kids at night. And that man, that rich man, had a guest come and, and, he, and, he, and he wanted something to eat. So he went over and he took that man's only little ewe lamb that he had and he had it killed and served it up for dinner for his friend. David flew into a rage and he said, who is that man? I'll have him killed. Nathan said, you be the man. The Bible says David's heart was cut because what had happened, David, when the people were out warring, he walks out on his palace roof and as he's looking over the city that God so graciously let him govern, he sees a woman taking a bath and he gets all hot and bothered. Yes, friends, it's all in the Bible. He gets all lit up. And so then he goes to his servants, go get that woman. I, I don't know who she is, but you get her and bring her to me. And so they got her, brought him to him. He uh, had relations with her and she got pregnant. And she was married 
to Uriah. And, and, and so now this gets really complicated. And so what he says is he tries to get Uriah to come home and, 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 and spend time with his wife so he'll think it's his kid. And, and that didn't happen. He says, how can I enjoy the, the comforts of my wife when my fellow uh, army men are out there on the battlefield? That would not be right. You know, he, Uriah was a good guy. And so uh, he tried getting him drunk, get, get him good and stoned, and maybe he'll go home and have a relationship with his wife. He didn't do that either. So finally, David writes out on a scroll, get the battle hot, and then when he's out all alone, Uriah's out all alone, retreat from him and let him be killed. He rolls it up, seals it with a seal, puts it in Uriah's hand, and Uriah delivers to Joab, the head of the army, his own death warrant. I can see Joab opening up. Whoa, what in the world is this? Now, there was other people that were killed in that little parade as well. Uriah's killed. David comes along as this great war hero and says, oh, I know you're pregnant, but I will marry you. The crowd is, good man, that's our king, marries a pregnant woman. And, 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 but it was his kid. God saw it all. So... Nathan comes by and gives him the story of the little ewe lamb. David heard it says, who is that man that took that? Ch I'll kill him. And he said, thou art the man. You see, our sin always looks so much worse on somebody else. How dare them do that when we're guilty of the same thing? And see, that's what the Bible talks about. If we're going to be honest, we're going to be good soldiers for Jesus. What we need is we need to be about our father's business. And being about our father's business means that we need, as Christians, to be in alignment with what God wants. And because we're in alignment with what God wants, we're going to be the most effective ministers for him. Every one of us listening to this today, you're all ministers in God's family. You're going to run into people I'll never see. You're going to run into people, a Sunday school teacher, elder, you'll never see. And, and this causes us to be effective for God. And so it tells us here that uh, he was outraged. Bring her here and, and we'll burn her. Um, pretty pretty uh, crazy stuff when he makes these claims. And so verse 25, and she was brought out. And she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, please determine who these are, the signet cord and the staff. And so Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I because I did not give her Sheila, my son, and he never knew her again. Now it came to pass at that time, giving birth, that behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first was giving birth and put its hand out. And the midwife took a scarlet thread, bound it around his hand. This one came out first. But it happened as he drew his hand back into her that his brother came out unexpectedly. And she said, how did you break through? This breach is upon you. Therefore, his name was called Perez. And after his brother came out, who had been the scarlet thread on his hand, his name was Zerah. Perez is the one whom the lineage of Jesus went through. Now I begin to understand something. You look at this story, the pictures that are in it, and you realize that in spite of all the things wrong that Judah did, God still used him. And God through Judah brought forth Messiah. I know a lot of times people will come up with excuses why God can't use me. I, I've done too many bad things. Uh, I can't go to church. I, I can't be around God's people. 
Let me tell you, when you really study the Bible and you realize all the things that went on in Jesus Christ's lineage, I doubt seriously if most of any of you were as bad as some of these people were. And yet Jesus did not feel ashamed to associate himself with humankind. You see, the Bible says that Jesus was fully God and he was fully man. I don't know how you can be 200% of anything, but the Bible says that he was. And because of that, he reaches his hand out to you and me saying, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I can fix whatever it is in your life. This morning, if you're broken, you recognize you're broken. There's something wrong in your heart. There's not something, it it doesn't flow right. There's just something that's uneasy in your soul and in your spirit. I want to invite you today to let Jesus take over your life. God is such a gentleman that he will not force his hand on you until you give him that permission. Now, God, I believe through prayer, will arrange circumstances so we will sometimes recognize our need for God. That's why you as saints don't stop praying for your unsaved loved ones. But God will not force a person's hand, you're going to accept me as Savior or I'm going to break your arm. No, God doesn't do that. It's where we recognize, I don't want another 10 years like I just had. I want God to do something new in my life today. First of all, your sins are forgiven. You have eternal life. That's good news. That's great news. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to see flowers in airports. You don't have to wear orange. All you do is say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. See, he died on the cross for you. His blood covered your sins. He died in your place. Sin is a capital offense. How many murders do you got to commit to be a murderer? A thousand? No, you just have to commit one murder to be a murderer. How many sins do you have to commit to be a sinner? Just one. But see, sin will separate us from God. Sin cuts the phone line to our communication to God in heaven. Jesus restored that. And now we can pray. And God begins this restorative work in us till we go be with him. He takes things out of our life. He puts things in our life. Sometimes God taking things out of my life have been very, very hard. Because, you know, I got to tell you, sometimes we like sin, don't we? But God shows us why it's bad for us, and he takes those things out. But then he puts new things in our life that's going to fulfill us. I have found that I am very capable of holding on to a lie and enjoying it for a while. But God says, that's a lie. You need the real thing. So God puts in the real thing in our life. You see, Judah, as we looked at this just a minute ago, he said, she's more righteous than I. See, he realized that if the proclamation of judgment that Judah gave, bring her out here and let her be burned, would have applied to him also according to Levitical law. Now, even though it had not yet been given, it's what God would say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If she needs to be burned, Judah, so do you. And so Judah essentially was a burned up guy and God still used him. God will use you. God will restore you to what he wants you to be. All it requires from you and me is a willingness to let him do that. Perfect gentleman, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. We open the door and let him do that. When you do that, God begins that work. I've had people come to me and say, well, I've been a Christian a month and my life still isn't like perfect, you know. Oh, how long did you live apart from God? 40 years. Wow, you're generous, giving God a whole month to straighten out your train wreck of 40 years. But you know what I find? Even though it took us 40 years or 30 years or 20 years or 15 years or 70 years to mess up our life, God uses super speed to rebuild us. And that's the good news. God's got quick setting primer and quick setting paint. And we need that in our life. This morning, if you're not right with God, pray. You may be a backslidden Christian. You may be a person that has never accepted Christ. Maybe you're somebody that you haven't given God a lot of thought and time since you were in Sunday school when you were a kid. Today's your day to come home and let God restore you and bless you and heal you. He will. You say, but I'm too far gone. No, 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 no. We just read today, God (laughs) and Judah 
the lion of the tribe of, of Messiah. Hey, listen, God's the great restorer. You need to be restored. We're going to pray right now. If you need to pray, ask God in your life. Let's do that. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I invite you into my life today. And though I've lived my life without you, I ask you to forgive me. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. His blood covered my sins. And so now, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empower me to love you and to love my fellow men. And give me boldness to speak of you. And thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. That's what God does.